Welcome all of you to this live program at Authentic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Ruth Delaney from Dublin, Ireland. Dr. Delaney is a consultant orthopedic surgeon specializing in shoulder surgery and also an associate clinical professor at the University College in Dublin, Ireland. She attended medical school in University College Cork, Ireland and went on to undergo the orthopedic training at the Harvard Combined Orthopedic Residency Program in Boston and also completed a shoulder fellowship with Professor J.P. Warner at the Mass General Hospital and has been in Lyon, France with uh, Dr. Giles Walsh and also at <coughs> France with Dr. Lauren Lafosse. She returned to Ireland in 2014 to begin her shoulder practice in Dublin at the Sports Surgery Clinic and at the Beacon Hospital, founding the Dublin Shoulder Institute in 2018. Her practice is a fully subspecialized practice focused entirely on the shoulder. She's a shoulder consultant to a professional rugby team as well. She's an active researcher, and in 2014, she won the NEO Award for her work on shoulder instability surgery. She's also a member of the American Shoulder and Elbow Society and a committee member of the European Society for Shoulder and Elbow. And she's been the Congress president for the European Shoulder and Elbow Society in 2022 at Dublin. She's a founding committee member of the Irish Shoulder and Elbow Society and also a deputy editor for the Shoulder and Elbow Research at the Journal of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Ruth Delaney from Dublin Island. Over to you, Ruth. Thank you very much, Dr. Helen. And uh, thank you for having me here as part of your, uh, your webinar series. Congratulations on a great education initiative. I'm going to talk about pre-op planning um, and mixed reality as it relates to shoulder arthroplasty. That's something I've um, been fortunate enough to have some experience with um, over the past uh, 18 months or so. Um, these are my disclosures, some of which are relevant to this uh, topic. So I think as far as um, the challenges in shoulder arthroplasty go, um, most shoulder surgeons will be familiar with the Walsh classification that we see here on the right in terms of the types of glenoid deformity that we encounter. And the glenoid component longevity is certainly our challenge, particularly in anatomic total shoulder. And that's what limits our options when we see younger patients with um, arthritis. And so the glenoid morphology as it relates to potential loosening and failure and instability of our glenoid component um, is something that's really important for us to understand. And choosing the best option for an individual patient uh, is something that we're becoming more sophisticated at thanks to 3D planning, uh, in particular, anatomic versus reverse uh, for a given deformity. And then of course, many options within both of those two categories. So what is pre-op planning? I think every surgeon pre-op plans to a certain extent, like we all spend time thinking about a case before we do it. We make a decision for the patient about what we're gonna do. And we look at the patient's imaging. And then we've got the more sophisticated um, tools that have come in the past few years in terms of software planning programs and the add-ons that come with those. Um, and so I think it's a natural progression for any surgeon to go from thinking about a case and looking at imaging and sort of mentally planning to actually getting some help with that in terms of software and other more sophisticated tools. So I think these days there are very few shoulder surgeons in the world who would do a shoulder arthroplasty without getting a CT scan first. And then built on top of your CT, you can look at 3D planning. Out of your 3D planning, you can then look at things that help your execution, a patient-specific instrumentation guide. Some companies offer navigation tools and you know, ultimately all of that building towards a successful arthroplasty. So at any point you can jump off of that continuum, right? But why would you, you know? I think the more that you can be accurate for your patients, the better. And then some surgeons don't like to pre-op plan, okay? There are some people who still feel that, well, listen, you know, it doesn't make any difference. I can do just as good a job without it. So when you ask one of the masters, you know, what about this, okay? What about surgeons who don't plan? And here's what Gilles Walsh had to say uh, on that topic. Well, they do what we used to do 30 years ago, meaning that they do a good job. They do operate perfectly the patient, of course, the best they can with their experience with their knowledge and uh, they are not aware exactly about angulation, about the orientation of the, of the prosthesis. So if well, we operate, well, they sorry. do what we used to do. If we operate then based on our knowledge and experience, I mean, is my knowledge and experience the same as everyone else's? Um, probably not, we're all different. Um, and then, 
is that enough? Is knowledge and experience on its own enough? I can eliminate that wide variation in knowledge and experience by using a consistent planning process. So why do we want to plan? Why do we want to get better? One of the main reasons is so that we optimize the implant position. And we know that this is worth doing because if you look at the literature, you'll see that glenoid components placed in neutral version versus 15 degrees retroverted will do better. When you place that component in a retroverted position, there will be earlier edge loading and you'll have increased contact pressures because of that decreased contact area with a more retroverted component. So if you're getting that eccentric wear, that may lead to earlier failure of your glenoid component. And so optimizing implant position is one part of why we plan. And I think, you know, when you, depending on which software program you use, it'll look a little bit different on the user interface, but they're all gonna show you um, measurements like the glenoid retroversion, the inclination, the posterior humeral subluxation. These are important um, aspects of the shoulder to understand. And we probably only had limited understanding of them when we looked at them in two dimensions. Um, and when we were trying to manually measure these things at maybe three or four points, instead of allowing a software program to measure many, many points. Then how about the inclination? So again, optimizing implant position. If we implant a glenoid component in an anatomic total shoulder with superior tilt, there's going to be higher rates of secondary cuff failure as seen in this study by Luc Travar, Frank Golka, Gilles Walsh. Um, and so again, implant positioning matters. The other part of planning as well as optimizing implant position is it helps you to understand exactly what you're dealing with. Um, as I alluded to a moment ago, when we used to try to measure these things manually, there would have been wide inter-observer variation um, and a lot of um, error in terms of just the, the blunt tool we were using manually measuring from 2D CTs. So in this case, for example, we've got a cuff tear arthropathy case or massive cuff tear case, and we can see there's some superior inclination, but what we can also appreciate um, even more detail because of the planning uh, software is the reverse shoulder arthroplasty angle, which is even a bit more than the overall superior inclination of the glenoid. Pascal Boileau has taught us about that. And it makes logical sense, right? We are going to put the base plate for the reverse shoulder replacement on that inferior part of the glenoid. So it's actually not really the overall inclination of the glenoid that's gonna matter as much as what that bottom part of the glenoid is doing. And in a lot of these shoulders, that's pointing upwards even more than the overall inclination. And so now the software program that I use has that built in as well. Because if you don't appreciate that reverse shoulder arthroplasty angle, you may accidentally put your base plate in superior tilt. And we know that in the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, we also need to avoid superior tilt because that also leads to early failure. And how we decide to address that then, of course, depends on your choice. Execution is always going to be up to the surgeon. Do you want to medialize more? Uh, do you want to um, lateralize with a metal augment? Do you want to lateralize with bone? But the key thing is that by understanding that RSA angle, you've avoided putting your base plate in superior tilt. Another situation with planning where you want to understand what you're dealing with is in the revision situations, be that revision arthroplasty, or like in this case, where there's been a failed ORIF in the past. This is a, a different software program that I also like to use. Um, and you can understand exactly what's in there, what you're left with. You can subtract the implants. Obviously, in a lot of revision cases, the humerus is more the challenge than the glenoid. So we look at the glenoid measurements here, they're not very problematic, but then we look on the humeral side and we're seeing where the bone loss is and what type of implant we want, might, might want to choose to address that. And I think that with this level of detail, it allows me to just have a better idea of what I can do for that patient. This is an arthroplasty revision case uh, where there's um, already an anatomic total shoulder in there. And again, we can get the glenoid measurements, we can plan where we would put our reverse, we can understand the component that's in there in a lot more detail than just on plain x-rays or even 2D CTs. So the workflow for any planning will usually involve getting a CT scan. Um, the parameters for the CT will be dictated by uh, the, the software and the company that you're uh, working with on your software side. But typically, it's not that different to a standard shoulder CT, only that you must include the body, the entire body of the scapula. Um, and the cuts might be a little bit thinner than what your uh, radiology department is already doing. So you just have to check with them. But it's really easy. There's a, 
CT um, protocol that you give the techs and the radiographers understand that. It'll tell them about exactly um, how the, the gantry angle is and the field of view and all these things that matter so that the software can take those raw DICOM files and segment them. Depending on what program you're using, the segmentation may be manual or it may be uh, automated. Manual segmentation and an engineer has to go through each slice or draw out the outline, feed that all in. Automated segmentation can happen just within the software within a matter of minutes. Um, and that has advantages for workflow. And then after that, you build your plan and then the add-ons. Automated segmentation can be really convenient because a lot of times, and I'm sure it's the same for a lot of you guys that are watching, you know, you're stuck for time, the patient gets their CT scan, you know, maybe not that far in advance of the surgery, your schedule is busy, so you end up doing it at night at home. And for me, automated segmentation is then great because I don't have to wait, you know, upload it, then wait for an engineer to come back to me 24, 48 hours later and then find time again to plan. You can do it all in one sitting and all really quite efficiently and quickly. And then getting from planning to execution is another key step. It's all very well to have a well thought out plan, but you have to take that from the computer into the patient. Um, and so going to that stage, um, we have a couple of different tools. And again, they vary across uh, different industry uh, companies. So patient specific instrumentation guides are something that I use a lot. Um, and those can be done a couple of different ways. So for example, the top right, um, you're seeing Stryker's version, which comes from Tournier Blueprint, which is what I use a lot. And so you build that guide as part of your planning, you're gonna build that guide, decide where your Glenno guide pin goes on your plan and therefore where you're gonna put it um, in real life will be dictated by this guide. You choose where the feet go on the glenoid um, and that guides you to, reproduce your plan exactly in the patient. Uh, the Arthrex system is shown to the left of that. Um, that has sort of a reusable guide um, that you can adjust the feet based on the, the plan and that'll kind of theoretically guide you to where you set on the computer. Then um, navigation, for example, Exactech have a navigation system that's been around for a while. Um, mixed reality, I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, Stryker have done a lot of work in that space with Blueprint. Um, and there are other things coming uh, down the track as well. Robotics is already part of hip and knee surgery and uh, it's certainly coming in the shoulder. And again, that's getting us from planning to execution. And when we want, you know, when we have a really difficult case, we really want to enable the best possible execution. For example, this patient, you can see the amount of erosion of her glenoid. She has juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. There's very little bone stock left. She's eroded all the way medial to, you know, as far as the base of the coracoid. So I think it would be really hard to figure out how to do this case without some sort of planning software. And you want to execute this the best possible. You want to do your best possible for every patient, but look at what age she is. She's only 30. We have to get this right because it's going to have to last for as long as possible. Unfortunately, she had already exhausted conservative measures, was having terrible pain and poor function. So there was really nothing else to do except consider arthroplasty for her. That's the coronal view of her shoulder. And so in a case like this, the planning really comes into its own. But what I would say is that if you only use pre-op planning on these really difficult cases, you're gonna struggle more because you're not used to the interface, you're not used to the tricks and, and the ease of use of the planning. So I think you should probably plan for all your cases. And then when it comes to the difficult ones where the advantage is really large in planning, you're not just breaking it out for the first time and trying to figure out the program. And I think that's really kind of the most efficient way to use it. So for her case, um, I spent a long time planning it. I plan every case and some easy primary cases might only take a couple of minutes, but for her case, I really had to spend a lot of time understanding her shoulder and finding where we could actually fit the components because there was so little bone that it was actually really hard to find the one spot down the pipe, down the, the middle of her glenoid vault where we could actually fit the post of, of the base plate uh, that we had to work with at the time. And so I think when you get to a complex um, case, it will tend to take you that bit longer. We decided we were going to use bone to deal with her deformity. So we're going to bone graft and this planning program allows us to calculate a custom bone graft so we know what the graft roughly should look like, what kind of shape we're looking for. Obviously, there's a little bit of wiggle room, there's a bit of adjustment, the graft is gonna compress behind the base plate. We want to do that, we want to get it to heal and it'll conform a little bit to the bone, but it's nice to have an idea of how thick of a graft you wanna take. So what we're looking at doing here is a bio RSA. We can plan the trajectory of our screws, see what sort of screw length we're gonna get through the base plate. Um, 
And there's a lot that we can figure out that we maybe didn't think about before we had planning. We can look at a theoretic range of motion. Um, I think you have to be a little bit careful with this because it's not going to be your true range of motion for a number of reasons. The obvious things are that the, the scapula is fixed in this model. And if you look under fluoroscopy at a patient, you know, abducting or flexing their shoulder, be it with or without an arthroplasty in there, that scapula, of course, is going to move as well. Um, and so your bony impingement may not happen as early as this tells you with a fixed scapula. The other thing um, is that this doesn't take into account your soft tissue. And that's the thing with a particular reverse. I mean, the software will let you plan anything you want to plan. Um, but you have to, as a surgeon, remember that you're dealing with length tension relationships of the deltoid of any remaining cuff and, of course, of the brachial plexus. So there's a limit to how much in real life you can lateralize or lengthen. And you have to be conscious of that when you're making your plan and comparing your plans. But it's nonetheless useful to compare different options. And, and this particular software allows you to save three different plans and compare them side by side in terms of how much you've distalized, how much you've lateralized, what the theoretic range of motion within those constraints that I just mentioned would be for each one versus the other. So you can see, okay, maybe not the absolute numbers are true, but yes, with this plan, all else being equal, my um, flexion might be better, my extension might be better, my external rotation. And I like to look at extension and external rotation, especially because I think those are relevant in terms of um, avoiding notching. So then we're getting to execution. So this is how I plan the, the guide, the patient specific guide based on the reaming axis of where I want my glenoid guide pin to be. And then the software will take that um, uh, plan and make a 3D model of both the patient's glenoid and the, um, the guide, this is that case that I showed you where the glenoid looks a little crazy because it's so medialized um, that it barely looks like a glenoid anymore. And this is the real life printout of the PSI guide from this um, uh, case. And I think it would have been really difficult to try to freehand this, to try to do this without a guide because I, I found it so hard on the computer to find the part of her glenoid vault that I could get enough bone to guide the post down of the base plate. And so having help replicating that in real life was really useful. In the end, we actually used a femoral head allograph for her bone because her humeral head bone was so soft. And we had anticipated this problem that her humeral head bone might be of such poor quality that a standard bio or SA might not work. Um, and so then in terms of your options after that, you can of course take iliac crest. Uh, she had a lot of hip and pelvic problems. So we wanted to leave that alone. So we took allograft. Healing rates of allograft are probably a little lower than autograft. Um, you can certainly um, look at augmenting that. I haven't done that, but I know some of the American surgeons would talk about injecting uh, bone marrow aspirate or BMP into the allograft to try to almost turn it into an autograft. But that's how we dealt with, uh, with her deformity. The other thing that planning will tell you is how much depth of that central post you're getting into the native bone. And that's important because in a case like this, you may even have to stage it. And we actually did have to stage her because we couldn't get one millimeter of post into native bone. We had such a big deformity to correct. So we actually put in the bone graft, base plate and glenosphere, and then came back four months later after a CT scan after that had healed and did put in the humeral component. The idea being that if you put the whole construct in at the same time, there's gonna be quite a lot of tension and shear forces across the bone graft uh, glenoid interface, particularly when you have a large bone graft, you can see in some of those previous pictures where uh, the, the angulation on the graft was a really high angle. And so I worried that the whole thing might just shear off the glenoid if we put the entire construct in. So we did a staged, um, procedure for her. Um, that was about four, almost five years ago, and she's doing really well so far, but there's a long way to go. And she probably at some point will need a, a revision, but I think planning helped us to execute that case as best as we possibly could. The other way to optimize execution that has come um, on stream recently is using mixed reality. So this is a Microsoft HoloLens that can project a hologram of your pre-op plan in front of your face while you operate. Um, and this was a really interesting development because um, it doesn't require the sort of resources that a navigation system or a robot requires in terms of capital investment on the, the part of the hospital, which in a lot of our systems is um, a roadblock to getting some of these new technologies. So I'll just show you a little bit about my first experience um, using this. Uh, to talk about mixed reality, um, basically it's somewhere between virtual reality and 
the normal environment. So the virtual environment being completely virtual, like when you see um, the Oculus headset, VR uh, gaming and VR that's now being used quite a bit in orthopedic education as well. And then augmented reality where you sort of can overlay items onto the real uh, world. And in mixed reality, the user can actually interact with those items. They're not just static. And that's what, what this is doing. And so our first cases where we used this were in April um, of 2021. And, uh, you know, I wondered about how it would be. I still had my plan taped to the wall, as you can see behind us there, because that's what we used to do before using mixed reality. Um, and, you know, I think you always have to sort of be ready for technical issues, technology to fail, you know, or just something kind of physical and ergonomic um, if you don't, if you're not comfortable with the headset on your head. Funnily enough, um, I found that actually quite easy to, to get used to. So we did two cases that day. I'm going to show you a video from those two cases. Um, both were osteoarthritis cases um, that ended up needing a reverse because of issues of glenoid version. Um, and so that's kind of what it looks like when you're operating. It doesn't really interfere too much. There's a little bit of a tint to the lenses. So it's like a slightly darker, it's like if you were wearing a very light sort of sunglasses and, and that takes a little bit of getting used to, but the visor can be flipped up and down by somebody who's not scrubbed, or you can even have somebody take the, the whole um, headset off and put it on you. And I'll do that sometimes say, if it's an approach I know is going to be difficult because the patient's very large or the glenoid is very retroverted or it's a revision, I might not start the case with the hollow lens on and I might just have my rep put it on my head when I get to the part that I need it for. In other cases, I might wear it skin to skin um, for the whole case. So um, in this video, the, the first patient's going to um, kind of talk about his shoulder. He's just a, a typical sort of arthritic shoulder story. He has now had both shoulders replaced. And I just saw him recently. He's doing great. But he happened to be our first case where we used this technology last year. Um, and then the second case is similar case. We addressed it slightly differently in terms of the components we chose. And the other difference is in the first case, you'll see I don't have a PSI guide because in my country, the lead time to get the guide from when you request it and design it is four weeks in the US. It's two weeks, I think. Um, and so with him, logistically, his CT was too late. It was too close to surgery. So that's also a way mixed reality can help you if you don't have access, either because of cost reasons or logistics or timing to the actual PSI guide. The mixed reality is another way to optimize your execution, even without that guide. I have a big problem with my two shoulders. So Mr. Lenny said after trying the injections and physio that the only solution was to get rid of the arthritis was a shoulder replacement. Well, the big problem at the minute is, is, is the pain. You know, it keeps me awake at night and it's very uncomfortable. But like I've been a sportsman all my life. Um, I row. I've been rowing since I was 14, still rowing with masters. And I play golf. And when Ruth told me I had to have this operation, she said to me, um, you'll be able to go back to your rowing and your golf. And that made it all worthwhile then. But uh, when she told me then that everybody up here was excited about this new procedure, it made me excited then because I felt, well, it's something special and I'm glad to be involved in it. So for his case, um, I'm going to use a bio-RSA to deal with his glenoid retroversion. Um, so I'm looking at, at first at my humerus. I'm going to do the humeral cut. We can um, take what's called a clone view of just the humerus and take it out of, of, of there and actually manipulate it, put it wherever I want to. There's, for those of you that may have done bio-RSA already, there's obviously a a jig that um, cuts at a, a 155 angle as it happens with the angled bio-RSA. I want to put in a stem that uses 135 so I'm going to revise my cut afterwards and the mixed reality plan will sort of help me um, match those up and then I'm going to place once I've exposed the glenoid my guide pin in the glenoid and this is the part of the case where um, I would use the PSI guide if I had it I don't have it so I'm using the standard one off of the kit and I'm using that clone view of the glenoid to sort of line that up and say okay you know am I reproducing in the patient what I said on the computer I wanted to do Otherwise, you're sort of manually doing it in the standard guide. 
for the reverse in this system, you it'll give you a 10 degree inferior tilt if you want, or just neutral. And then otherwise you're just moving your hand like we always used to, to sort of say, okay, I know that he's starting at 22 degrees retroverted and I want to put my component in at five, I'll go a little bit this way. And so when you have this hologram, you can match it up. And in fact, you can lay it right over the glenoid and line everything up and see, do they match? It can be a little bit tricky to see it, um, when the operating lights are on your field. So sometimes I'll even bring the lights away to make it darker and really like see that hologram well. And then it's nice to know, you know, how much did I plan to ream? Obviously these days we understand we don't want to get too much into the subchondral bone. We're not going to medialize too much with our reaming, um, but it's nice to be able to look up and see on my plan rather than asking the rep to look at the plan on the wall or walking, leaving the field and walking over myself to look. I can see everything I want to see right in front of me. As you can see, it's dynamic. We've gone from the humeral view to the glenoid view. Um, and I'm gonna place the, I'm gonna drill for the screws through the base plate now. And what I found was sort of a, a nice side benefit of um, this planning was that I seemed to be getting longer lengths on my screws, like drilling a better trajectory for the screws in the um, uh, base plate because of somehow subconsciously understanding that patient's scapula better. And I think that was because I had a 3D model of that scapula in front of my face while I was choosing, you know, there's a little bit of variable angle in those uh, locking screws in the base plate in most systems. And even just sort of subconsciously by seeing the 3D uh, representation of that scapula and being able to orientate it whatever way I wanted, I was able to get longer uh, screw trajectories um, through my uh, base plate, which I also thought was kind of interesting. As you can see there, we also have the picture of our graft that we chose. And I almost always choose a custom graft even for the more straightforward cases so that I'm not just taking the standard graft. I may not want quite that much bulk. And so on my hologram, I can see what the shape of my bone graft should be as well. And uh, that also helps. So here we're just still drilling our, uh, our four screws through that particular base plate. Um, and then we're gonna have a look uh, after we put our components on the glenoid side, we'll um, go back and take a look at the humerus again. If we wanna revise that cut um, and how our components went in, we'll have known from our planning if we made what sort of eccentricity there is say of the humeral canal relative to the, the head. Um, we can double check that and see, you know, if that still makes sense based on what we're seeing in real life. Um, and so it's kind of a, a way of double checking yourself. It doesn't really add to your operative time. This is, um, you know, a recording real time of my very first case with it. So, you know, it's not really that difficult to get used to it. I think the key is if you're already used to using the planning software that you're seeing in mixed reality, then it's not much extra effort or complication to add the mixed reality part. And then we can look at that theoretic range of motion um, of the completed construct that we were talking about a moment ago in the planning software. So it's, you know, basically everything that you have in your blueprint planning software you can have now in front of your face dynamically while you're operating without having to go over to a computer. Obviously the, the person who's wearing the HoloLens is the only one who's seeing this hologram, but the uh, HoloLens is also uh, wirelessly um, communicating with a tablet that shows that to everyone else in the room. You can hook up the tablet to a bigger monitor, which is what we do if we have visitors, and then everyone can really see what the surgeon is seeing. Um, and I think that's great because what I hadn't really thought about was nobody else is really seeing the glenoid the way I'm seeing it when I'm operating. And the rep who's quite an experienced rep said to me, you know, I've never had that view of the glenoid before. Cause of course I have that view and I'm in the way and nobody else is getting to see unless maybe showing the fellow. The other thing is you have your CT scan here loaded up too on the planning and you can scroll up and down through your CT in whatever plane you want to the axial coronal and sagittal views. And that's nice besides having to go over to the viewing box or the computer or ask someone to bring up a different view of the CT, you can look through it depending what part of the case you are, what you, what you wanna see. This case, I have a PSI guide. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to sort of match up the mixed reality and the, the patient specific instrumentation. When you use a PSI guide, it's not foolproof. You have to make sure that your glenoid exposure is good enough that there's no soft tissue in your way you know, and here I'm kind of just checking that I really am seating that because you've designed those little feet to sit on the glenoid. And unless you put them where they're supposed to be, your guide print's not going to be in the right place. If there are glenoid osteophytes, you don't want to take them off with your osteotome before putting in your PSI guide because you planned your guide with the osteotome still there on the CT. Yes, in the planning software, there's a tool that you can remove osteophytes. I usually don't do it on the glenoid for my guide. I might do it when I'm looking at range of motion. 
but it's very hard to be sure that whatever you removed on the computer is the same exact amount and same exact place that you remove in real life and then your guide may not fit. So I think it's better to just leave the osteophytes there and then um, just, you know, after you've placed the guide on the guide pin, deal with them. Um, so here we're doing the same steps. We're um, reaming the glenoid and sort of paying attention to our plan. Um, and then uh, again, looking at the implants all together as one construct in our uh, mixed reality. Um, you have to be obviously a little bit careful um, when you're doing these gestures, you know, nobody else can see what you're doing. You're looking at this and you just need to be, you kind of warn the team that, you know, I'm going to be putting my hands up here in space. Tell me if I, you know, look like I'm going to put my hand and, and contaminate myself somewhere or something silly like this. But we had no problems actually the first day and I still um, use it on all cases, you know, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on the case, but um, I have it loaded up for every single arthroplasty case. Again, you know, you're just gonna see the same steps here where we, uh, we're gonna drill the screws. And the same thing happened in the second case and has been happening consistently in the reverse cases that I do with this, that I just seem to understand the scapula anatomy so much better by having it uh, in 3D in front of my face. We can skip on a little bit. We go through the same, um, sorry, uh, go through the same um, steps as in the last case and uh, then put in our humeral component, uh, look at what we think we should be able to achieve in range of motion and maybe even compare that to what we, uh, what we got in real life. Um, so those are just the sort of different interface um, screens that you can have, but it's all based on the software that for me was very familiar um, from having planned my cases over the last number of years. I was lucky as a fellow that um, halfway through my fellowship year, I got to see the prototype of the Blueprint software. The Glenesis program was Gilles Walsh and then with J.P. Warner. So I've kind of, to an extent, um, grown up with the planning a little bit. But certainly the beginning of my fellowship, we didn't have this. And we were doing the Friedman line and, and 2D measurements. So it's been a, a good timing for me to sort of see the, uh, the evolution. So thinking about the early experience with mixed reality, it's definitely more user friendly than I expected. I think there are still some minor user interface issues to be optimized um, and Stryker are working with Microsoft on this particular uh, blueprint program to help with all of that. Um, I think everything else I've sort of said as we went along, having my CT in front of me, having my 3D plan in front of me was really great so that I could just look at it dynamically whenever I wanted to. Um, the base plate screws we've talked about, those cases where I didn't have a PSI guide, I think, the mixed reality helps even more um, than the ones you have a PSI guide, you sort of have double cover. You've got two ways of helping your execution. Um, I think teaching is, is a huge benefit of this as well. Even just by having the HoloLens on your head, you can show people things. I don't work in a system where we have resources like some of the major centers in North America where we have video for teams and we can make cool videos for conferences and all that kind of stuff. But when you have just a HoloLens like this, the quality of video, as you saw there, is actually pretty good that it records. And so you can make good videos for teaching. You can show in real time, live during your surgery, what's going on. You can, as I said, hook it up to any kind of screen you want to. That tablet will connect via HDMI cable to a big screen on the wall. And so when you have people visiting or you have medical students, fellows, residents, they can be much more engaged with what you're doing and have that bird's eye view as well. And then if you add in the hologram, they can see what you're talking about with your planning. So I've enjoyed it for teaching purposes as well. And I do it for, for every case. I might just put it on for a few minutes when I'm dealing with the glenoid or I might wear it for the whole case. Um, but I think it's something that, that is a useful um, addition to what we do. I think we have to you know, be a little bit careful, all of these planning programs and everybody has one now, every company, um, 3D planning, you know, different companies, use different landmarks to generate the numbers that they're giving you, different algorithms. That Blueprint program is using this best fit sphere model of the glenoid. Um, there are other ways to do it as well. So I think, you know, developing a little bit of an understanding of the background and just not blindly trusting the number. If something looks wrong, then question it. And, and in this program, you can do that. You can sort of request a manual segmentation if you think the automated segmentation has not quite gotten it right. Um, we talked about how it doesn't account for soft tissue tensioning, um, and so the range of motion predictions are not necessarily in absolute terms reliable, they're useful for comparison. You're still the surgeon, though, you still have to make the judgment calls. And in revision cases, the segmentation is more challenging. Right now, we don't have automated segmentation licensed uh, to use for that. We still need the engineers to go through it, but we do have planning now for revisions, and I think that's where it comes into its own as well, because those are the harder cases. But again, you don't want to 
only bother planning when you have a difficult revision. If you're used to planning your easy primaries, then I think you can get a lot more out of it when it comes to the difficult cases and the revisions. The mixed reality, the next phase is going to be using guided navigation, so markerless navigation, using the mixed reality as opposing as opposed to the current navigation systems that are out there. Um, and then robotics is coming, and I think a few different companies are looking at robotic-assisted shoulder arthroplasty. And of course, that's debatable. People will say, well, I don't know if it's going to make it any better. Is it going to change the clinical outcomes? That's hard to prove, and that's going to take a long time to show. Um, and it may be that it's only a subset of cases that it improves things in, the more difficult cases. We've all been there when we've had really challenging glenoid exposures and really difficult to get that straight shot to get the reamer in. So maybe that robot's going to be able to help us to machine the glenoid in a way that we don't have to be able to reach in there, um, but we're always the ones who are driving it. We're always the ones as surgeons who are making the decision. The robot isn't going to completely take away our jobs yet. And ultimately, in all of these new technologies, we want to never forget the human being on the receiving end, the person attached to the shoulder. Um, and that's kind of what we're here for, is to do our best possible job for that person. So thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you about this a little bit today. Thank you, Ruth, for the wonderful presentation. Ruth, you can stop sharing, actually. Perfect. Thank you, Ruth, for the great presentation and congratulations for the cutting edge work that you do at the Dublin Shoulder Institute. Thank you. Uh, Ruth, a few questions from our side. Mm -hmm. Now, Ruth, you have mentioned two great technology. Like, for example, you have the pre-op planning software as well as the mixed reality, right? So let's do the first part of pre-op planning. So how often do you think the surgeon accepts the plan that the software is given. For example, regarding the version inclination, you fix, you go according to the plan almost maybe 90% of the time. How often is it? And with I'm respect saying, to yeah. version as well as inclination, uh, as well as the humoral component. I would say on the measurements like version and inclination, um, for me, I would say greater than 90% of the time, 95% plus of the time. Um, I think the occasions where I don't, it can be something that has, fooled the automated segmentation part of the software, like a um, maybe a large glenoid osteophyte at the front, and it's taking its measurement from the tip of that osteophyte instead of really from the glenoid, um, something like that. Um, similarly with inclination, or maybe if I have a question about, you know, this is one of those big debates, what's zero inclination, you know, um, is it the horizontal, is it the scapular spine, the trigonum? Um, sometimes I have not accepted the measurement, questioned it, They've manually segmented it, come back and said, yep, no, it's it's the same. It's it, it the computer was right. And that's okay. Um, but it's it's pretty rare. Most of the time I accept it. The humoral planning, I think we haven't spent as much time thinking about, you know. Um, and there's not as many parameters. I guess the um posterior humoral subluxation is kind of one of the key measures that we want. And, and that's probably more straightforward. I think I've never really had problems with the estimation on that one. And do you think the severity of the glenoid pathology affects it? For example, you have a neoglenoid, or if there is significant glenoid bone loss, are you going to have a difference in the plan? You may. And I think what's really interesting, and I would encourage everyone to do this if you can get access to it, if you take the same CT scan and run it through like different companies' softwares, that can be really good fun because then it shows you that you know, you may get slightly different answers and who's right and who's wrong. You know, we, there may be not one right or one wrong answer. Um, and I, I think that's, that's quite interesting. Um, I had a case where say the, the version was something crazy. Like the guy had a, a C type glenoid and was like 54 degrees retroverted. Um, and we, you know, we played with that a few different ways. And uh, one program said he was 45 degrees uh, in an automated segmentation way. And then I asked for it to be manually segmented and another program said 54 and like, what is it, you know? Um, so I think that just shows you that you need to keep an open mind. And I think probably in the, like you were saying really like, you know, when it's less deformed, I think you could probably get probably the same answer from different softwares, but if you get a bigger deformity, you may see in the different methods a bit of divergence, and then you have to start to apply your own judgment. Thank you, Ruth, for that. And uh, Ruth, you also mentioned about the augmented reality, right? So where mm -hmm. do you feel the advantage of augmented reality? Again, with, is it with the glenoid or the humoral side? I think it's going to be both. Um, and it depends probably on your case where 
you know, your bigger problem is where it helps you most. Um, because the planning is a little more glenoid focused up to now, then we probably can do more on the glenoid side right now. And uh, yeah, before I introduce you to Loy, do you have any data, for example, a level one data that says, okay, surgery with an augmented reality versus without augmented reality, there's a difference? There's data that shows that implant placement is more uh, accurate in terms of reproducing a plan. Uh, even if you only plan and don't have a PSI guide and don't have mixed reality, even just the act of planning. Um, we don't have data yet on the mixed reality itself. Um, PSI guides, there are some data out there, but the key data that I think is missing and that's hard to convince you know, payers to, to invest in, in any um, cost that's gonna be associated with this is the clinical outcome part, because we're taking something that already has really good clinical outcomes, right? Like shoulder replacements do well, anatomic and reverse generally. And, and we're trying to show like a, there's almost a ceiling effect. Like we're, it, so we don't have that data. And I don't know if we'll get that data on simple primary cases like ever. Um, I think where we may get it is your 40 year old, 45 year old that you have to put an anatomic shoulder in that you know, maybe you won't have to revise them or they'll last 20 or 30 years instead of 15 years, but that's gonna take us all those years to prove. So I think that it's gonna take us a number of years to um, be able to show a difference in clinical outcome. And that's really what matters. Thank you, Ruth, for that. Ruth, we also joined by Loy al -Khatib. Loy is a sports medicine surgeon and a shoulder surgeon based in Dubai. Loy, your questions to Ruth, please. Ruth, you need to unmute first, please. I'm sorry, uh, Lloyd. Yeah, thanks, Ruth. Thanks for joining us today. Um, one, one, we've got two questions. When you're on doubt uh, regarding the glenoid parameters, mm -hmm. the glenoid virgin, superior inclination, do you think using the plain X rays, the axial and coronal views to measure these parameters is a rel rel reliable method or that plain X rays will overestimate uh, the parameters? What do you think about that? I think it's very difficult on x-ray. Um, I think it depends on the quality of your x-rays. If it's a true AP of the joint, if you have a really good axial or axillary lateral view. But I think x-rays for me, I don't think I can really get a good idea of them. CT scan in 2D with manual, manual measurements, that's what we used to do, right? So we would take the, the, the Friedman method, the Friedman line um, down the, the body of the scapula, um, measure the glenoid face relative to it. And you were supposed to, the way that Friedman described it was, I guess, take the, the level of cut. Cause remember you can, you know, scroll up and down anywhere. So again, depending where you choose to measure, you're gonna get different numbers, but his method was the tip of the coracoid and the four slices immediately below that. Um, I think if you don't have a planning software, you know, you have to make some attempt at understanding the version. And I think you shouldn't do that without a CT. So for me, agree, playing yeah. So need... are, are, yeah. I mean, yeah. for me, plain x-rays are not gonna do it. Okay. And for the scapular need, at least it, as I know, as far as I know, is the eight centimeter of scapular length, more uh, at least 50% of the scapular height, just to get the correct parameters. You mean for the CT or uh, for, for the CT measuring? for the CT for the CT. Yeah, I think each you know each program will have a little bit of a different protocol, but they're all similar. And it's what my understanding is: you've got to have the entire scapular body, and your cuts usually need to be one millimeter, or maybe at most one point two five millimeters, um, depending on the program. Yeah. So regarding that case, I realized that you are depending on the. By your RSA and you are avoiding the metallicity augmented. Is there any reason behind that? Yeah, I think that's a good debate to have because that's something we talked about for that case. That case came from another surgeon who asked me to come help her with it. And, you know, she had looked at, okay, should we get a custom implant? Or, you know, um, at that time we didn't have as many augmented base plate options as we have now. My thinking with that patient was that because she was young, if we did it with metal, then whenever we have to do a revision, which let's face it, we probably will have to revise her at some point in her life and in our professional lifetimes, then we'll still be left with the same problem we started out with if we take a big metal component, put it in there and then have to take it out. Um, so for her, I was hoping that we could rebuild a glenoid and you'll have people who argue, well, we don't think that 
the allograft really heals or it resorbs. I've revised a case where the patient fell and um, dislocated and, and kind of displaced her base plate. And I had done a bio or say, and I went back in and, and the bone had healed. Um, it's anecdotal. So that was the idea that, you know, we just wanted her to have bone and maybe have a better glenoid to deal with next time we come back. If you're, I think, not dealing with that sort of unusual situation of a very young patient and longevity and revision concerns, George Athwal has shown um, this past year that there's no difference that, you know, if you lateralize with metal or with bone, there's no difference in a radio stereometric um, study in terms of uh, component migration, and there's no difference in terms of clinical outcomes. Um, the other thing that comes into it, and this was an issue for us up until we've gotten it changed a little bit, the cost of the augmented base plate. So I'm not talking about the custom ones. Those obviously can be really, really uh, expensive. Oh, yeah, like the, just the normal, like off the shelf augments, for us until recently, they cost a lot more than the standard base plate. So the bone is free. So that's the other um, aspect. And now Stryker have, they're not on the market on general release yet, but they have custom base plates, which are sort of an in-between, right? They're not the huge custom implants like a VRS or something that cost a lot, but they are like the custom bone graft that I was showing you. It's the same thing, except in metal. So you get a base plate that's all one piece, but the back of it's customized to your patient probably going to be a little more expensive than a standard augment, um, but it's another way to do it. So I think uh, whether you're philosophically wanting to have bone in there versus happy to have metal in there and whether you have cost constraints, that's probably what comes into it. Uh, okay, thanks a lot. I think that's for the two questions that uh, I've been asked so far. Do you have more questions here? Yeah, that's it, uh, Lloyd. Thank you, Ruth, uh, once again for the brilliant presentation. And let me congratulate you once again uh, for this amazing work that you do at the Dublin Shoulder Institute. And I'm sure this talk is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you, Ruth, once again. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Take Cheers. care. Thank you. Bye-bye.